When you're lonely, it's hard to find anything around you that can make you feel better. Loneliness just puts you in this place where you feel like you're devoid of meaning. Humans are meant to be together. And that love, its foundation, is connection. I was a total pusher. Wake up at 5.30 in the morning and I'd bike 40 miles before breakfast. I had my own video production company. There were times where we'd go out and we would shoot five interviews a day in five different locations. I'd take a shower, go out on a date, drink a bottle of wine, and do it six days in a row. There was a constant push. That's how I lived my life. When my talk show started, that's when a transition happened in America. People said, I want my voice to be heard. I wanted to do a show that gave voices to people who normally weren't heard. And the Emmy Award goes to Montel Williams, the Montel Williams Show. Graphic design, art direction, Donna Karen, Estee Lauder. My work was on the inside front pages of top fashion magazines. I traveled all over the world. That was something that I really fell in love with. I wanted to play drums in a rock band since I was probably about 12 years old. Met those guys when I was in college. Bought a van, we started doing shows around the Northeast. We ended up on Capitol Records. You're doing it every single night for seven months out of the year. It's like, you're gonna get good, and it's family. I just felt like the world was my oyster. The patient with multiple sclerosis staggers down a long road, weaving between despair on the one side and hope on the other. The doctor who must guide this patient is faced with a disorder in which the diagnosis is a gamble of odds and probabilities. Ha! Cue the mad music! Imagine going back to 1946, getting diagnosed with MS. In fairness, at that point, there was no help it's not going to work out for you. There's nothing we can do. Go home, put your affairs in order, and just be prepared to, at some point, pass away from this disease. Your body gets confused and attacks your spinal cord. Doctors said to me, almost like, you need to go home and die. The biggest struggle is just the emotional side of it. I didn't know how long I had to live. Certainly what makes MS so warped is that you don't know what's going to happen to you. Boy, if I could make a bargain, I can live like this. We just can't imagine what our lives are going to be like in the future. It's a monstrous realization. Forces greater than you within your own body. It's heavy. I'm scared because of my daughter. I want to be there for her. You keep hoping she'll get better, but uh, lately, I've kind of been losing hope. My worst fear up until now has come true. Who could believe this athletic, creative person could have MS? I'll never forget that loss of control and also not knowing when it's going to be over. The fear of the unknown ends up being a lot scarier than the known. The term multiple sclerosis comes from the French for multiple scars, these bright spots. And that's a piece of brain that's been damaged. And anytime something is scarred and damaged, it doesn't quite work as well as it used to. MS is as different as people are different. I had had crushing fatigue for a while and I had numbness and tingling in my hands. I started jogging outside, but I couldn't lift my leg anymore. There was something really weird that happened when I was teaching fourth grade. There was a sentence written out on the whiteboard and I like forgot how to read. The 
immune system, which is supposed to fight infection, decides that it's going to attack the myelin that covers the nerves. Over time, when the nerve degenerates, then the symptoms can show up gradually and worsen. Spent 45 days in the hospital, couldn't walk, couldn't talk, had facial paralysis on the left side of my face. I had known that there was something wrong with me for years, but could never get a doctor to diagnose it properly. The doctors, they were like, it can't be MS. It can't be, I've never seen a black man. It's gotta be something else. MS back then was a disease that was characterized as being a disease of Caucasian women of Northern European descent. I think the only African-American that had been diagnosed and had been publicly diagnosed was Lola Falana and Richard Pryor. You start to think you're crazy because the doctors can't pinpoint why you have pain. When someone's newly diagnosed with MS, there's a whole lot of questions that we can't always answer. It's new. This is now my second time meeting with Dr. Beauvais. I don't even know that it's sunk in yet. At the start of the diagnosis, it's so critical to acknowledge how upsetting and stressful it is. I am not used to being this tired. I didn't even used to take naps. <laughs> I never stopped moving. So just to orient you, it's actually easier if we start with the front of the brain. I, I, you don't know what to do. You can look at her and you say, oh, she looks fine. But that's not really what's going on. We're looking for those white spots, okay, that are like here. Mm -hmm. That one's a little subtle. Mm -hmm. um, How do I explain this to my kids? The five-year-old, one time she overheard something about like spots on my brain. It's easier for her to think like, oh yeah, mommy's eye's not working. Like well, the doctors are gonna fi figure out what's wrong with you, mommy, and you're gonna get better. But it's like, how do you explain that maybe I will, maybe I won't? The doctor said, Pete, you got MS. Go to an emergency right now. You're gonna be in for a week. I was like, doctor, you gotta be kidding me. I have a gig tonight. <laughs> I couldn't feel my hand, man. It felt like I had a ham for a hand, which I hit a symbol and like missed it completely. My wife, she's like, you're gonna be in a wheelchair. But I wasn't having, I was like, no, I feel fine. Like, I'm, I, can't, I can't feel my arm, <laughs> right? I was engaged. The relationship dissolved soon after I got out of the hospital. I was alone. My wife, Kim and I were married in 1986. The divorce rate is higher for people with MS, so I know that I'm fortunate that she's the type of person that stayed with me. I was always a very active person, and I was in the Coast Guard Reserves for five years. So many times I feel utterly helpless. You know, it's tiring just being in the hospital all the time. I don't get too angry about it anymore. I get um, very sad. I'm just disappointed how things turned out. If I had known all this was going to happen, I would have done other things with my life. People hear you have MS and they immediately go to the darkest place possible. Everybody has this moment with a diagnosis where you don't even know how to move forward. You are all alone, tipping over the edge, and your reality is going to be horrible. The only way to connect in some sort of lonely moment when you're deeply scared is to throw out that you're deeply scared. Sharing stories, it is a first step to healing. And the medical community is beginning to understand the power of that too. I have developed a way of visualizing MS, and I visualize this using the metaphor of a pool. I view the nervous system as this pool of reserve, and there's the hemispheres, the brainstem, and the shallow end of the pool, the spinal cord and the optic nerve. 
The cerebral hemispheres of the brain have so much capacity to rewire and compensate. But the simpler areas of the nervous system, like the spinal cord, that tube of wires, there's not a lot of room there to work around. Some lesions, for instance those in the shallow end, are more likely to cross the threshold and cause symptoms that we can see, whereas lesions that are in the deep end might hide below the threshold and not cause something that we know about. There are profound good days and bad days with multiple sclerosis where sometimes the tank is empty and sometimes the tank is more full. What is incredible about the brain is that it compensates so beautifully for this kind of damage. What can the person with MS do to fill the tank and keep the brain stimulated in the face of this disease? What we're seeing today is a complete shift for what it means to live with the disease. You have a lot of treatment options, but that doesn't underestimate the one thing that you know, can't be prescribed, which is that connection to a person. When I was diagnosed, the first thing I did was I went online to find somebody to emotionally relate to at the time of my biggest vulnerability. Over time, I've met a group of people who were sad, scared, or vulnerable, that had real problems, yet here they are persevering and connecting. For me, that changed my course of healing completely. Technology lets people connect with each other in ways that we couldn't do before. They tell each other stories, and, and so that inspires another person, and then there's this multiplier effect. That, psychologically, has so many benefits. They take the plunge and they get such a wonderful response in return that all of a sudden it makes them feel better. Just wanted to give everybody an update on the happenings around Diana's life. Me. In my mind, there's two of me. There's me, the creative person, with all the ideas, the abilities, and the training. And then there's the MS me that cannot do those things. Fatigue, pain, cognitive fog. To the outside world, the person looks perfectly well, but the patient is suffering greatly. August 2018 was the last time I had an MRI. They put the ear, like the ear cloggers, what are they called, not earmuffs, whatever, noise canceling thingamajigs. And, but it's still loud. You're close. Yes. I feel like I've been at a loss for words. Cognitive fog, cog fog for short, that comes for many people with MS, can be scary. Stress is a big trigger for me, so if when my stress level goes up, that cog fog sets in and my brain almost shuts off. For example, if in a mall there's many entrances and many exits, if I don't necessarily remember exactly which entrance I came in, I don't remember where I parked, stress level goes up, brain shuts off, it's very hard to produce even the simplest of thoughts. I was a nonfiction creative writer. I was witty and self-deprecating and mean and funny. I used to be Comedy Central and now I'm Sesame Street. If I could find the words. I just can't, my brain's just not the same. People struggle with disclosing the disease to their employers, to their friends, to their families. Divulging that I have this chronic illness was not easy. So I hid it. I hid it from everybody. Why would you hire someone that's gonna deteriorate before your eyes? Oh, is it there? Lori? Hey. The elevator's not working. Not really what I had in mind. In too many places, in too many circumstances, people immediately hear you have MS and they, they immediately go like, well, can you even continue working? The, the West Wing story is a good example. He was diagnosed about seven years ago. My particular course of MS is called relapsing remitting. Jed? All the things that you could have kept from me, I, 
You haven't called me Jed since I was elected. Why didn't you tell me? Because I wanted to be the president. I love this line with the West Wing um, because I think everybody understands the fear of not getting to do what you want. The show let people know he had the ability to continue on to be the president. You don't have to live down to someone else's expectation. You can live up to your own. Neurology is almost an existential field. It speaks to who a person truly is. It gets right at our concept of identity and human experience, and I think our diseases touch that in a very profound way. Part of being a good doctor is being a little bit of a journalist. You're trying to really understand deep things, how they feel and perceive and see and speak and think. The pattern of symptoms, it's different in everybody. Where those individual lesions land really drives the symptoms that a person has. This is a very characteristic MRI scan for someone who's had MS for a long time. And in fact, this MRI scan is Elizabeth Jones's MRI. When you stop having relapses and you can tell that your balance is off and things are going subtly downhill, that it's most likely secondary progressive. Those are the signs. So that's happening. I, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, I almost fell about five times, just standing and, you know, teetering. I always have to tell people I'm not drunk, that it's MS. My mentor, Fred Lublin, had created the categories of MS, what we call relapsing remitting MS, which is when there's these episodes that recover, and secondary progressive MS, which starts with relapses but then gives way to this gradual worsening of disability, and then primary progressive MS, which is the sort of smallest type of MS, but a type that concerns us a lot, where patients will develop gradual disability and never have a relapse. How do you feel? Weak. The spinal cord is really a tube of wires. And when a lesion damages the ability of those signals to pass through those wires, that's when things like weakness and walking difficulty develop. Ready, set, go. Good, keep going. Good. Okay. okay. Nobody understands having MS unless they have MS. I found different ways to physically use my body. It's great to ride a horse. It's helped with my strength and my balance. We want to continue to treat to prevent new lesions, new symptoms, but also have you continue to push yourself to renew reserve and keep your tank as full as possible. I think when people retreat from the world, the brain suffers. What can they do to boost and maintain their brain's health and their brain's reserve? The mental health challenges can really feel overwhelming at times, and that's where the people connection is so important. Staying connected is huge. Social engagement, cognitive engagement, positive mood, not letting the disease cause someone to become isolated. Those are things that help the brain to form connections and help to keep the tank full. I think we can only see certain things on an MRI scan, for instance. You can see the spots. You can't see how someone processes that and you can't see their attitude and their motivation and their spirit. When I was finally diagnosed, I decided to go public with it immediately. I suffer from MS. 
I have extreme neurologic pain in my lower extremities. I'm in pain 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I knew that there was no voice for Abbas in this country, and I had a pretty big platform. I made the choice to be extremely proactive with my disease, rather than sit back and let it ravage me. The first neurologist I saw, I asked her, what can I do? You know, what, what, what can I do to help? And she was, nothing. You can do nothing. And I go, okay. I walked out of there. I go, she's fired, honey. Verna needed something that would give her some motivation and some inspiration. And she was able to find her passion in painting. I didn't know I could paint prior to MS. I was painting for those boys of mine. I wanted them to have a piece of me. I hate that feeling of being helpless, so I try to focus on things that I can do. Saturday, I've got something special planned. It's our 35th wedding anniversary, and we decided a few months ago that we were gonna renew our vows. And now I've got my tiny grandson. We've been waiting for this for a long time. Becky has pretty progressive form. To stay emotionally strong is easy for me to say, since I'm not in that position. But she gains some emotional strength just by being with her grandchild. Wow. Having him here really makes life worth living. Hi, Luke. It's your grandma, Becky. I'm always going to be on the side of hope rather than on the side of despair. And that's the only thing you can do. You're okay, I've got you, Luke. And I'm not letting it go. I had to like embrace my deficiencies. So I can't play like I did before. I just learned how to play a little bit smarter, a little slower, a little groovier. And I think overall it kind of helped my playing. I'm doing what I love, you know, and I'm not letting MS stop me. Alexa, lock the back door. Technology is my best friend, and I happen to be an engineer, so I'm able to utilize the technology better than a lot of folks in my situation. My wife said, I'm doing a piece in school about inclusiveness, and could you come in and talk to kids about disability? It's exhilarating. Most of my life I've been this huge introvert, but when I'm talking about my story and finding that it helps people, all of a sudden I look forward to these talks. So here's some ways that we're alike. You folks smile, and I smile. You like to hang out with your friends, so do I. You don't like to be excluded. He's been able to present saying, I'm you. I'm in a wheelchair and this happens, but they hear the message loud and strong, just valuing life and being resilient. I have to separate myself from like the MS symptoms, the cognition issues. There was just this light bulb moment like, Psh, I am not MS. I'm Diana and I'm awesome. And these symptoms don't define me. Even though this is not what I went to school for, I've always wanted to be a working mom. She has her whole future and like, I will do anything to be there. I'll like wheelchair myself there. I'll cane myself there. I am not gonna not be there. A couple of weeks after I was diagnosed, I realized that the walk I messed that year was on the day that I was supposed to be getting married. I knew that I had to be there. Really, until that walk, I'd never met anybody with MS. Once I knew that I wasn't alone, it got easier. Once I started building that community, I realized that there is power through discussion. I was asked what my biggest fear was moving forward with my future. My true biggest fear is not finding her. By her, I mean my future wife. When is the right time to fess up to somebody that you love, that you have MS? If somebody rejects you at that point, then that person wasn't the right person. I was going out on a third date with a guy that I thought I really liked. The day I was diagnosed, he went away. That was the end of that relationship. 
Hey everybody, this is Sergio and Mayra. <laughs> I met a woman who didn't let MS define who I was and what that was going to mean for us and our family. You can just see the level of compassion that he brings. I know it's going to be good. When I met Tyler on day three, I decided it was time to bring it up. Look. I could be in a wheelchair in six months. I could never have an episode again. I just don't know. He didn't even hesitate. He just decided to take the gamble. So, I've been busy. I am in the process of helping plan my wedding. You don't know what the future holds, but knowing that I have someone on my side that will be there no matter what takes away all that fear. To withdraw and suffer alone is probably one of the most painful human experiences there is. To communicate, to have fellowship, being with a person is probably one of the greatest gifts that we can give. Human connection plays a huge role, not just in helping MS patients cope and function, but it actually is life-giving to the brain. Hi! Elizabeth. I need people. I need them around me. I need to feel like I'm part of a community. Hi! How are you? So nice to be oh here. Oh my Thank God, you come on me. in. I've got this network of friends and associates all around the world now. We discuss MS issues, disability issues. Feels good to have somebody on my side. Look at me, I'm, I'm playing drums. When you do what you love, it gives me energy. MS is not an anchor. It's empowered me in many ways to be that strong person that I always knew I was. Engaging the community is a huge thing. We can have hope for patients, we can make a difference. Everything's gonna be just fine. Everything's gonna be okay. There's not a person out there watching this right now who doesn't know someone without us. Don't wait for them to call you and ask you to come over. Go over anyway. I've heard it said that loneliness is a nod to the isolation and nothingness of the universe. Being together creates love. Thing you want to do 